Yes, I can go. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our COP chat this morning uh, on youth and human rights. Um, okay. We will be joined by Asako for the opening remarks. Asako, off to you. Will you be turning on the video? The video is on right now, but I'll pick. Okay. I think people can see you, Asako. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Would you like to keep up? Oh, okay. Oh, it's uh, my turn to speak. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Good afternoon, colleagues. I heard that the 80 of you are connected. Uh, is it so? Uh, it's exciting to uh, have uh, the uh, webinar uh, on you standing up for human rights. Uh, it is one of the earliest uh, the uh, webinar for governance, uh, the uh, community of practice, and then we are happy uh, to see that this uh, a particular topic was chosen uh, to to uh, kick us off in the uh, the uh, 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 community of practice. Actually, I uh, need to to start off by apologizing you all because I was very much looking forward to participating all through the uh, uh, the uh, webinar, but I was uh, also called in to the uh, the uh, video call uh, organized by AHIM administrator. So I need to step out uh, for an hour, but I intend to come back uh, because uh, I'm really looking forward to, to how discussion uh, will lead us to. Um, as you might know that the, uh, this year, so the uh, Human Rights Day on 10th of December uh, was assigned to, to, to um, uh, link up with the youth. Uh, actually, it was the uh, anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It's the 71st anniversary, I think. Uh, and then, uh, in particular, uh, last year, 2019, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Madame Bachelet has chosen the youth uh, standing up uh, for human rights. Um, so uh, uh, this topic is very relevant. I have been engaging with the uh, uh, 16 by 16 youth uh, uh, working on SDG 16s, and I was so uh, inspired, excited to hear their experience and the power the youth have uh, in uh, uh, getting uh, this uh, uh, somewhat uh, difficult uh, agenda in the society because it uh, relates, uh, the human rights relate, actually speak to, to the discrimination, the inequality, all that things that, that requires the, uh, the uh, whole of the society approach and engagement of youth. So I'm so excited that the, uh, we would explore what can we do more uh, to get the uh, more conscious of the youth uh, and then to uh, spread uh, throughout uh, the globe, uh, the uh, world, uh, on this topic. I uh, had uh, recall uh, in the, one of the, uh, the exchanges with the uh, 16 by 16 youth, uh, one of the, uh, the participants said that the, it is important uh, to spread the, the, uh, the concept or, or the perception that the, uh, it's cool to be conscious. And then I took that word uh, the, uh, very uh, seriously. I mean, how we can uh, get the, uh, the, you know, all the buying from young ones to get engaged and then uh, to work on the new modalities so that uh, we can actually uh, tr uh, transform the society itself. So it's a really uh, exciting uh, the, uh, topic that the, uh, we have in front of us. Uh, uh, and, and then look forward uh, to hearing uh, the, uh, your views on that. I'm sorry I will miss the presentation, uh, but I would definitely catch up uh, through video and then they are getting feedback uh, from uh, the uh, Noella and uh, Sarah and others. Uh, so um, uh, let's uh, uh, make this uh, webinar a kick off uh, the event. Uh, uh, we would uh, continue discussion on online platform, discussion forum, exchanges, and uh, various forms that the uh, COP uh, community of practice uh, is
to make things work and share the uh, knowledge and the good practices to make changes on the ground. So uh, I'm excited uh, uh, that the, uh, the I can kick this all, uh, start uh, the uh, this exciting uh, discussion. I hope that the, uh, uh, we will have a fruitful discussion. Thank you all, and over to you, Noera and Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Asako. It's truly wonderful to uh, to count on senior leadership support. Uh, to promote young people's power and thank you for making the time to join us in particular during the executive board of UNDP. This is very much appreciated. Um, welcome to, to this webinar again. My name is Noelia Richard. I lead the youth portfolio here in New York and the UNDP Youth Global Program. I'm very happy to be here uh, with a number of colleagues and uh, in particular my co-moderator uh, Sarah Rattray. Uh, and our colleagues Maria Stage from the youth team and Esgi uh, Osturk, uh, the facilitator of our governance community of practitioners, uh, with whom we have uh, curated this very special discussion on youth standing up for human rights, building on the theme of the Human Rights Day at the end of 2019. We're honored uh, to count on the participation of three young experts, uh, peace builders, human rights activists, and field practitioners, Neville Charlton, Wevin Muganda, uh, Daniel Kalarko and our colleague from UNDP country office in Ukraine, uh, Elena, Olena Orsu. Uh, I will introduce them in greater uh, detail shortly. Thanks very much to, to the four of you uh, for joining and we're, we're very grateful for, for your time and your insights. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this conversation also because we're bringing together voices of, uh, and experiences of young people from grassroots level together with our large uh, network of colleagues working uh, at country, regional, and global levels. Some of them are youth experts, some of them are human rights experts, some of them are working on both, some of them are perhaps working on none and willing to learn, and that's what we're here to do, to challenge assumptions about youth, to discuss promising practices, identify gaps, and uh, good opportunities also to improve policy and programming support. The theme is also very dear to our heart here in UNDP. Um, it's uh, it's, it's uh, the, the promotion of youth empowerment is uh, primarily happening as a human rights uh, based issue in a context in which institutions have tended to talk a lot and perhaps uh, listen a bit less or act a bit less, in which young people also demand that their voices are heard and uh, demand to more accountability and more inclusion. Uh, from their government and in a context also in which sadly civic spaces are really shrinking and young people in particular, young peace builders, young human rights defenders are facing a lot of threats. And also in a context in which uh, we're uh, showcasing how uh, UNDP also is part of uh, the UN reform and taking this issue very seriously. In UNDP, we firmly believe that young people play a positive role uh, in development and peace, but uh, we also uh, recognize that this potential can only be unleashed if we, uh, if we support the human rights of young people, if we strengthen youth agency and really look carefully at, at these governance, human rights uh, issues to have an enabling environment for youth to really uh, contribute and, and uh, be able to be heard. So before introducing the, the panel, I only want to say also that this issue is really at the heart of the youth peace and security global agenda, uh, that the, the in particular the need for civic spaces, the need to protect and promote the rights of young peace builders and young human rights defenders is very much at the heart of the progress study on youth peace and security that was presented in the Security Council. We can expect that it would be uh, also at the heart of the, the, the forthcoming Secretary General's report uh, to be presented uh, in, in spring. And it's also a key pillar of the UN youth strategy uh, titled Youth 2030. I'll be moderating the first part of this discussion, the panel uh, with our three uh, speakers, um, and before handing over the mic to my colleague Sarah, uh, we will hear uh, three presentations consecutively and then open the, the, the floor for Q&A. We will have ample time uh, for discussions. You're welcome to type uh, questions during, uh, during the conversations as well in the chat box, uh, and, and we will make sure that we group 
uh, questions and address them uh, later on. So now turning on to our distinguished panelists, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really pleased to introduce Neville. Uh, Neville Charlton is the founder and chairman of Youth Inspiring Positive Change in Jamaica, uh, a registered NGO that engages youth in development, volunteerism, social change, peace building, uh, and related fields in, in Jamaica. Neville is also a member of the 16 uh, by 16 initiative that Asako just mentioned, uh, a global initiative that UNDP launched in 2019 to support and, and work together with young people from grassroots, uh, leading grassroots organizations, leading uh, initiatives advancing SDG 16, SDG 16, peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. Uh, so Neville, you, you have the floor, and we look forward to hearing about your work in Jamaica. Thank you. Hi, right, so good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Noella. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everybody for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure to be joining the discussion on human rights, especially from a youth context. So as Noella had mentioned earlier, I am the chair and founder of Youth Inspiring Positive Change, which basically is a nonprofit organization that really focuses on advocacy, volunteerism, and peace building. Um, I'll be breaking down the presentation into in the two parts. The first part is I'll be speaking about our work as it relates to gender-based violence from a human rights perspective and also human trafficking, um, especially zoning in on human trafficking because that's a violation for me personally. Um, trafficking person is a violation of person's all basic rights. Um, so, We'll be looking at human trafficking in context and how young people can advocate for the rights um, of those persons that are trafficked and also help to advocate for um, and help put an end to human trafficking. So I'll be breaking it down and helping persons to really see what human trafficking is. Um, and we also can look at 2002 where the where the convention, the United, Na United Nations Convention Against Human Trafficking was passed by the UN. Um, so exactly what is human trafficking? Human trafficking is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbor, and uh, receipt of uh, um, persons. Um, to, and that's basically to achieve persons' consent out of control over another person. Um, so what we're doing, especially here in Jamaica now, is that um, the National Integrity Action, which is, uh, in, which is an organization focused on integrity corruption and combating corruption um, and also allowing for transparency they have identified various young people across Jamaica and in collaboration with the Jamaica Constable Force they are training and building the capacity of young people to basically advocate and adv and, and rally um, for the really rally for change and really help to empower young people to be a part of it. So what the Jamaica Constable Force will be doing is that they will be, the, especially the unit that is responsible for trafficking in person, which is the ATIP Vice Squad, um, they are training these young people, including myself, and it's basically a chain of trainers. So what we did is that the through the NIA and also the Jamaica Constable Force, they look at building young people capacity for the trainers and then we in turn will go back into our communities, go back into our schools, university, and basically empower young people against um, human trafficking, how to identify human trafficking and how to advance change. For me personally, this is a very big thing because human trafficking is occurring all across the world. It's a global dilemma, a dilemma that breaches all our fundamental um, human rights. And if we don't empower young people with the tools necessary for us um, to be a part of that change, then obviously um, we are on a wrong path. Um, the very next thing is partnership. Partnership in the sense that partnership is critical um, for human rights, especially as it relates to youth. Because without partnership, especially zoning in and SDG um, 17, which is partnership for the goals, um, for the achievement of the goals, partnership is essential. And 
organizations both locally and globally need to look at the need that we need to work with young people we need to partner with young people and i can even attest to the 16 by 16 initiative which i was a part of this was a very good platform for us to voice our issues especially at the international level to really advance and choose that from my personal experience i have seen firsthand um, that human rights, especially as it relates to youth, is something that we need to zone in and pay special attention to, especially working with some of these young people from across the globe, realize that we are all, while we might all be different, we are all the same. Ne Neville, we can. Sorry to interrupt, but we cannot hear you anymore. We don't know if there is an issue with your mic. GBV gender-based violence is a global phenomenon affecting us. Neville. Um, globally, Neville? and we have to put a put an end to it. Especially looking at the context from in from Jamaica. Usually, we are persons of the view that. You know, men, women, boys and girls are sometimes of the view that they are the property of another. And we need to change that mindset. And as young people, what we are, what we are, well, what we actually did is that since recently we did a regional peace tour, um, in collaboration with the Two Cent Movement and also, um, Neville, we're really sorry British, to interrupt. British, um, the UK Neville, can in, you hear in, us? In, in the Caribbean, and they provided funding. Now, to basically, did is that they are doing a regional school tour and we are looking at how young people can create safe spaces mm -hmm. in high school to really advocate for change, safe spaces, safe spaces against gender-based mm -hmm. violence, safe spaces identifying what is gender-based violence, also safe spaces identifying what their rights are and how they can identify if their human rights are being infringed because a lot of persons in school A lot of persons in schools basically don't know what their human rights are. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Neville, we can hear you now. We lost you for, for a second, but colleagues in the region are confirming that they're still able to hear you. Sorry to interrupt. All right, no, I'm just checking in, just checking in. Um, so when I, I'm, I'm jumping back, so what was the last thing that you heard? Should I continue on gender-based violence and the work that we're doing in high school? Yes. 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 Thank you, Neville. Okay. Great. Um, so one of the things is basically employing young persons um, who chose the region and some of the territories that um, the organization went to included Jamaica, Belize, um, Bahamas and also St. Lucia. And what we are basically doing is employing young people um, to identify gender-based violence from a very early age and what are some of the rights that it breach. Um, also talking about partnership as well, jumping back to partnership because I really see partnership to, to really advance our advocate for human rights is essential, especially looking at UNDP locally and the work that we are doing with UNDP in Jamaica. They are doing a lot of webinars, also doing a lot of go um, work with grassroots organizations and it's really important to know that without partnership um, we are we are basically fighting a lost cause um, so I'm going to wrap up and just say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done especially as it relates to human rights and putting young people at the forefront is, 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 is important especially helping young people to identify, critically identify what are some of the human rights and also organizations that they can work with, collaborate with um, to basically advance for their rights. Um, so I'll just make the charge that, you know, always try to seek out young people. I always try to support the work of young people because it's very difficult and really aligning yourself with various organizations and being a part of initiatives such as the 16 by 16 also working with various NGOs locally and internationally is also important and NGOs also both internationally need to see the need to empower young people and give them a chance, give them a voice, give them a platform for them to speak out and take action. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Neville. I'm sure we can uh, also uh, deepen the conversation on partnerships. Also in the in the Q and A, it's great to hear your thoughts in particular around uh, around human trafficking, around uh, GBV, the importance also of uh, identifying the the right. Uh, institutions to collaborate with around human rights with uh, young people at the center. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking forward to a conversation as to how also UNDP country offices uh, in, in Jamaica, if colleagues are connected, but also in other countries uh, are, are supporting that. Uh, we will now move to Olena. Uh, Olena, who has been uh, with UNDP Ukraine for almost uh, 15 years and uh, who has led the, th the team on democratization, human rights, and civil society development. Uh, she has previously served as a governance expert on sustainable development and public administration reform, and she will tell us about the latest initiatives in, in Ukraine. Uh, Olena, you have the floor. Uh, thanks a lot, dear Eski. Thanks a lot. Uh, dear colleagues, they are all greetings from Ukraine, and I'm pleased to talk to you about the experience of UNDP Ukraine on actually supporting the government to enhance youth engagement in human rights and civic activism countrywide. And I will start by sharing a few words about the context in which we are operating. You can see uh, most of the figures that I wanted to share with you on this slide, but in general, it is commonly agreed in Ukraine that the national systems, laws, and policies don't advance the realization of human rights. You can check this diagram from the UNDP's recent uh, survey on what Ukrainians think and know uh, about human rights, and it actually shows that 55% of Ukrainians have never tried to use formal, formal state mechanisms for protection of their rights in the situations of when those were violated. And it is commonly understood that there is a low level of trust among people towards the state in principle and the state mechanism, which leads to poor engagement in national development processes. And in addition to that, of course, the human rights uh, situation remains heavily influenced by the conflict. Uh, we have uh, many people who have suffered uh, from the conflict since 2014. Many of them um, were uh, killed or their houses were damaged or destroyed. And in addition to that, there are uh, more than one million internally displaced persons across the country with difficulties to access the basic services. So as you may imagine, there are many human rights challenges. and. In this situation, unfortunately, the youth civic participation still remains quite low. Only 3% of young people are members of the youth civil society organizations, whereas uh, one third of young people would like to contribute actively to the development of their communities, but at the same time, 35% of them believes that the local authorities do not take into consideration the opinion of young people in decision making. And unfortunately, about uh, slightly more than 50% of young people say they would like to leave Ukraine for education or after graduating from the university. So the next slide, please. So what does uh, UNDP do to help the government engage youth to stand up for their rights? Well, given its broad development mandate and its role as SDG integrator currently, UNDP works jointly with other agencies uh, to develop innovative and scalable solutions for youth engagement. Our work on youth and human rights is mostly implemented through the Democratic Governance Program as well as the Recovery and Peace Building Program in the East. And basically through these programs we have worked on the following areas. It's enhancing interest in human rights among youth and raising the awareness of human rights values, integrating human rights in journalism education, empowering youth to be engaged in policy making through civic education and innovation, and engaging youth for social cohesion. So I will tell uh, a little bit more about these experiences. The next slide. Um, well, in principle, the human rights organization in Ukraine acknowledged the fact that there is a very low inflow of the so-called newcomers to the human rights activism. All the same people continue working on depressing human rights issues. Because of this pressure, high-speed regime and the conflict, they either burn out or decide to continue their work in politics where they think they have more opportunities to make changes. And therefore, UNDP, together with its national partners, 
uh, like the Ombudsperson's Office and civil society organizations run many capacity development activities and programs to reach out to young women and men and motivate them to join the human rights movements in Ukraine. So, for example, in 2019 alone, we engaged over 2,000 young women and men through various activities like youth festivals, human rights weekends, non-formal human rights schools and uh, in the different activities and now they have knowledge and skills to promote human rights values among their peers. As the result, with support of different civil society organizations, these young people implemented many national initiatives on human rights activism and ad advocated for adoption of national and subnational development policies. Uh, this could be, for example, advocacy for establishment of the Youth Center or Youth Council as the mechanism for young people to contribute to decision making or addressing the needs of some vulnerable groups like people with visual impairments or national minorities. And the next slide, please. We also try to work with the National Human Rights Institution, which is the Ombudsperson's uh, Office in Ukraine, and also the Human Rights Defenders on contributing uh, well, what we hope to be contributing to mentality and behavioral change of young people through many different measures. So one of the recent examples of this activity is that, for example, in 2019, uh, we've produced the human rights photo exhibition, which is called Just Like You. It features 10 stories of Ukrainians representing different groups, like, for example, people with disabilities, Roma, LGBTQ people, moms of kids with disabilities, and other groups of people to try to explain the issue to young people and try to encourage them to join the human rights movement. And informed and inspired by these activities, young people create their media products on human rights, and we observe now how this course is changing. So, for example, in 2019, we've collected uh, many essays, photos, posters, uh, which are created by young people and then promoted locally. Um, on the next slide, you can see the information of uh, our work on how we integrate human rights in journalism education. Since our study showed that 75% tentatively of Ukrainians receive information about human rights from media. We launched cooperation with journalism universities across Ukraine. And over the past two years, we also held the Human Rights Academy for professors of journalism and also two human rights media festivals for young people themselves who are studying journalism in the universities. And as the result of this whole complex of activities, the human rights agenda was included in the curriculum of up to 20 universities. And now, uh, on the sustainable basis, we cover a lot of young people with this education on human rights every year. Next slide, please. We also support the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sports to uh, promote civic education for youth workers, who are people who are supposed to work with youth and engage young people. So this course, which we developed together in 2017, it also covers important issues like the human rights-based approach and tries to develop critical thinking, media literacy, and uh, provide the skills to implementation of various civic activism initiatives. This course was so successful in Ukraine that the local authorities started replicating it at their own uh, cost. And uh, last year, we have three successful cases of this kind. And for 2020, we received many more initiatives. And this is particular of its practical nature, because the graduates of this course then help young people to come together and design the initiatives for their community. Like on this slide, you see young people on the bikes. This is the picture from Zaporizhia municipality, which is the municipality, the industrial center with very poor environmental situation. And young people advocated for the bicycle infrastructure creation in this municipality. They ran the advocacy campaign, and this was very successful because the city council adopted the local uh, program uh, to establish the bicycle infrastructure in the uh, country. Uh, so, uh, in addition to that, uh, next slide, we work uh, to support young people to generate innovative ideas. We have designed the so-called Youth Innovation Challenge as a platform where we bring together IT specialists, uh, ministries, government, mentors, and human rights defenders 
to uh, provide capacity development to young people, but also help them create teams, generate ideas, and implement the most promising ideas for their communities. So, for example, one of these initiatives was to create the web checker, which would uh, be able to test the websites, whether they match the needs of people with visual impairments. And it was a very small, minor initiative by the youth team, but at the end, the state gover e governance agency uh, implemented it in the state policy as the mandatory standard for all the government websites. So we consider that this is a huge success when it, something as small as developed by the uh, team of young people, women and men, uh, becomes picked up by the national policy level. And the last uh, slide from my side, I wanted to share how we work on the social cohesion. This is, of course, mostly through our recovery and peace building program, which is in the east of the country. Uh, we've engaged the teachers as key providers of civic skills through the so-called network of ambassadors of peace. We've conducted a number of youth study visits when people from conflict-affected areas visit the other part of the country of Ukraine and they start re reconciliation services among their peers to help resolve conflict situation. And at the moment, we are supporting the government in designing the National Unity Youth Mobility Program to support something similar nationwide. They see, the current government sees that this is a very promising start for the national dialogue, dialogue on national unity, social cohesion, peace building across the whole country. And they believe that these small experiences that we have across the whole country need to be scaled up for the whole country. And we really hope that we will be able to cover it, uh, to, to, to share and replicate these experiences on a wider scale. And that would be it from my side. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olena. This is such a rich portfolio that you have uh, that you have in Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure we'll have many questions. The, the work you're doing with young journalists and journalists in general, I think, is in particular really interesting. And uh, the 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 work also with young people with intellectual disabilities, uh, I'm sure that a lot of country offices really could learn a lot from that. Uh, we're already uh, brainstorming in the room in terms of uh, your initiatives related to social cohesion and how that could be most helpful uh, for, for Sudan and Libya and the conversations we have at the moment. So uh, thank you very much for, for sharing that. And we know that thank we will you. be also uh, uh, strengthening or at least uh, trying to, to work with, you know, to, to strengthen a very rich already portfolio in, in Ukraine together. Uh, thank you very much. And please, uh, colleagues, continue to use the chat box. And if you uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, to start uh, typing them, of course, as, as we go. Um, so next uh, speaker, I'm sure, will be actually very interested uh, in your experience with theater. Uh, Daniel Calarco uh, was born in the countryside of Brazil. Uh, he moved then to Rio de Janeiro I've, at a very young age, uh, living in uh, two favelas that were very famous for uh, being overrun by, by the war on drugs, by an environment of violence and social exclusion, where uh, accessing rights was, uh, was and is to <laughs> to still a very large extent almost impossible. Daniel is currently an exchange student uh, and a fellow at Columbia Law School, and he believes that education really changed his life uh, and continues to do so. Uh, to give back to the community in 2015, Daniel founded the International Youth Watch, uh, a student organization um, uh, linked to a, a very big foundation in, in Brazil. Uh, with the aim to, to lead uh, studies on the situation of youth, with a particular focus on uh, youth uh, and their role in, in social cohesion and peace. And he's now involved with a very interesting initiative called the Theatre for Change. So, uh, Daniel, thank you very much for joining, and over to you. Thank you, Noella, for the kind introduction. And just checking, can you hear me? Oh, I'm not really. Yes, perfect, loud and clear. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for the amazing opportunity to join this panel with a brilliant diplomat of United Nations and young, young people inspiring change across the globe. 
As Noella just mentioned, I am the founder of the International Youth Watch, that's a youth-led organization created by favela leaders. And our main work now focuses on creating change by providing consulting, capacity building, and advocacy campaigns for youth rights. And our guidelines are the 2030 Agenda, more mainly focus on the SDG 16, 10, and 8, that are very critical for the Brazilian scenario nowadays. As I was raised in a favela, and youth vulnerability for me is a very important and personal topic, because just to give you a sense of how is the youth situation now in Brazil, young people, according to the federal law, range from 15 years old to 29 years old, and we count from one quarter of the population. It means 51 million of young people in Brazil now. But although we are a huge number, we are considered a minority. Because here in Brazil, half of the all homicides and murders are committed against young people. In the day, according to the official data from the Brazilian government and also from the United Nations, in 2017, 30, 35,000 young people were murdered and victims of homicides. Just in that year, 30,000 people. 35,000 people is an outrageous number of early deaths that we have in Brazil. We also have in Brazil an index called Youth Vulnerability Index that was made by federal government in UNESCO. And according to this data, if we're thinking about Rio de Janeiro, that where I, that where, where I go, I grew up, there is no place where the vulnerability of young people are low or below the average. So to live in Rio de Janeiro is always dangerous and threatening for young people. We have four millions of young people in Rio de Janeiro right now. That's a huge number of people living in a vulnerability status. The IVJ, that's the Vulnerability Index, considered not only homicides and violence against young people, but it also considered the social and economic exclusion by var variables considering access to jobs and access and attendance into schools, and also the racial and the gender-based difference. So being young people can deeply affect your ability to access economic and social rights, deeply related to violence. In Rio de Janeiro, state and police violence play a major role in this culture of violence and conflict. Considering race and gender, as I just mentioned, if you are a black young man, you have three times more chance of being murdered and killed in Brazil than a white young man. And if you are young black women, you have twice the chance of being victim of violence than a white young woman. So you being part of intersectional groups, like living in favelas, being black or being women, make you even more vulnerable. But I don't want to seem hopeless because that's a meeting to think about change and a strategy to implement the change. And as Noella just mentioned, now the International Youth Work, based with our previous experience and also based on this, the work of Columbia University and Broadway Advocacy Coalition based in New York, I implemented a program called Teach of Change, Youth Law and Activism. Teach of Change tries to face the, one of the underlying causes of this culture of violence and exclusion against favelas. Unfortunately, now in Brazil, the, the hate speech, the fake news, and also the harm speech against minorities and against favela communities are driving this public safety strategy that is combating violence with violence, where the state is present in the favelas just with the guns and just with the military force to try and to implement the peace by force. This kind of policy is based on the idea that young people living in a favela are potential marginals. So we have we could identify a clear course and a clear narrative of how favela and favela young people are dangerous and they are not worth to have rights to have a right. So they are not worth to have social assistance and just they need to be policed and to be like put under the under the law and under the, the police surveillance. And they still Theater of Change, that in Portuguese is called Teatro da Mudança, is a program that's trying to create new narratives about what peace and justice means in Rio de Janeiro by listening to the young people that are being mostly affected by the public safety measures. 
Unfortunately, as in Latin America and also countries out of the region, the people who are leading the change, who are leading the public safety agendas, the stakeholders, they are not the people who are being directly impacted by the, the policies they are doing. So they do, live, they do not live in favelas or they don't have any kind of access to the people who are being directly affected because those people are having to, has a, those people have a real high cost of participation to enjoy the political debate and also to enjoy some activism and human rights agenda. So the situation is that. So the people who are making decisions about what space, peace and what is justice are not listening to the people who are being deeply impacted. Theater of Change is a three steps methodology program. First of all, we are providing a course on human rights for favela leaders and law students. We are creating democratic spaces inside of universities, universities that are including people from favelas and people who are going to become the, the rule makers in the future to discuss what is the system we have in place and what are the main flaws and the main changes we need now. So the first step is to provide capacity building for young people in the, in the forefront of human rights violations by state and police violence. But we don't think that just technical data, because a lot of data I just share with you is available, even provided by the government, is going to be enough to create change. So very similar with the work that Olena is leading at in Ukraine, we are going to lead a workshop using art, arts and performance, music and poetry as tools to catalyze the narratives of, your, of young people being affected by police. So after the course, these people are going to join a, a workshop on arts that's going to amplify the narratives and voice about what is justice for them, what is peace for them, and what the change they need and they want to see that taking place. Because violence and the state actions are really harming them and preventing them to access the full potential. For example, shootings prevent people from going to school or going to or getting a job in Brazil. So violence is creating a cycle of economic and social exclusion that is perpetrating their own violence. And the last stop of the theater of change is going to create a campaign of youth for peace that's going to be based also in the results of the course of thinking about the possible solutions and to use the personal narratives of young people as a strategy to create empathy, to create mobilization of institutions towards a common agenda. Because as I told you, we can identify a clear agenda, a main course of violence and stating that people from favela are not entitled to have human rights because of their connection to crime, to connection to drug dealers. So now we have to create a very clear, impactful narrative that people from favelas are human beings and they are part of the solution, not part of the problem. So we are going to try to drive the policies we propose in the workshop and the course using the personal and narratives and the stories of young people that, like me and other thousands of young people, are just looking for opportunities in, to create peace and inclusion on their own communities. So this campaign is going to mobilize institutions and people using art as a strategy to create peace. And I think that's a kind of insight that's very helpful to be in dialogue with the United Nations. Because to be working with state and police violence can put young people in a very dangerous position. So it's always good to have in any space, in any country, as Latin America and also some countries across, across different continents, to have international support, to create spaces of dialogues between the youth being affected by violence and the stakeholders taking the decisions about peace and justice. Because as young people, we may have the voice, but we, we need to create spaces as the campaign to be listened by the stakeholders and to create space by our own selves that makes us safe and willing to contribute to the discussion of what peace and justice look like by decreasing conflicts, decreasing tension, it creates a culture of peace where young people are not more the victims or the perpetrators, but part of the change. So thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to hear back from you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. I mean, you, you just outlined what, what type of, I think, uh, paradigm shift we want to see uh, when, when it comes to, to dialogue and social cohesion and uh, yeah, the facts that you gave are absolutely uh, not unbelievable, but, but, but close to that. And, uh, and it's, it's really, really, really inspiring to see how, 
how you manage to to craft that, uh, such a strategy also to to go where young people are as well and not just bring young people to to the usual um spaces for uh, so-called decision making and policy making so <laughs> very very inspiring and uh, we hope that we can continue to collaborate so we're now moving into the discussion uh, part um, where we're going to hear from uh, different colleagues discussions questions and i will hand over now to my colleague sarah Rattray. thank you good morning good, good afternoon good evening everybody thank you so much for joining us um, and just to add to Noella's uh, comments, thank you so much for, to the presenters so far for such rich contributions. Um, it's uh, really inspiring all the work that you're doing. Before we open the floor, we have one uh, discussant that we wanted to invite to share her perspective first. Um, and this is Ms. Wevan Muganda, um, who is a human rights activist from Mombasa in Kenya. Uh, she has a very influential blog, Beyond the Lines, which is really also looking at disrupting narratives, particularly around uh, violent extremism and how to enhance peace and security. She's also uh, leading a film project um, which seeks to amplify voices of young people in informal spaces focused on social issues. And she's been involved in the development and implementation of the Mombasa County Action Plan for, for preventing and countering violent extremism and the Rome Youth Call in Action. She's an award recipient of the She Can Award for Outstanding Work in Advancing Human Rights and Increasing Access to Justice for Women who are particularly affected by violence. And because of her extensive experience, she's also um, briefed the UN Security Council uh, last July on the implementation of the resolutions uh, 2250 and 2419 on youth peace and security. And um, she's also one of the 16 by 16 cohorts, so we're delighted she can bring that perspective as well and, and the Young Leaders Initiative. Um, I probably could go on and on, but I'll hand over to Wevan now. And Wevan, we really invite you to share your thoughts on what you've heard so far and, and to challenge us as well on some of the trends, recommendations, what you think we could all be um, looking to um, as the way forward. So thank you so much, Wev, and I hope you can hear us. Um, yes, I can hear you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and, and it's really interesting to listen to everyone's uh, perspective on youth standing up for human rights. I think what we probably, uh, what, what I would probably emphasize on is um, the participation of young people um, in uh, decision-making processes, but also how the lack of uh, human rights education is what has caused this. So for so many young people, uh, I mean, they're seen mostly as victims of human rights violations. And even though uh, resolutions like 2250 and uh, 2419 uh, show the urgency in, in, in the positive role that young people play, still so many institutions and governments and organizations do not uh, create that space for young people to participate. And so... Uh, the, the, the aspect of uh, education, human rights education, not just education that would provide uh, ways in which you can be literate, but education that would um, open your eyes and perspectives to the world, education that would allow you to uh, live in, 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 in today's world, um, being cognizant of the global challenges that exist. And... Uh, for many young people who cannot access even the formal education, the situation is worse. And so that's why through uh, my film project, Kaulize Tuntani, I go into informal spaces and we call them maskanis. And these are, are uh, chill spots where young people would sit and uh, this, these spaces have been used before to radicalize and recruit young people into violent groups. But then these are also spaces that, if can be used well, can be an avenue to mobilize young people towards change. And so what we've been doing is that we have discussions on different social justice issues. It could be around governance, it could be around security or the importance of education. 
and young people are able to clearly talk about how they feel about their involvement, their participation. And this is important because for me as a, as a, as a youth leader and part of 16 by 16, I have the privilege of um, being part of, you know, campaigns, being part of uh, the advocacy at the global level. And, and while even for us young people who are leaders, we're still trying to, to include ourselves, so to say, and invite ourselves to some of these spaces, um, the issue of representation. So as young leaders who get these opportunities, what do we say or what do we push for? And it is important, at least for me, that when I get the opportunity to represent young people, that I speak about what it truly means to be young, to, to be young in a, a country or in a place where uh, human rights is still not appreciated as much. So that is one, but also um, how, the, how does the online community, so many young people are in, the, are in online spaces and the kind of narratives that they're reading influence how they think and how they act. And so there's so many narratives of violence, of hate, even being spread by leaders. And there aren't many counter narratives to that. And so very many young people are being exposed to negative um, information, to miseducation. And um, I felt that, you know, having a different, sharing a different narrative, sharing a positive narrative about young people's in involvement, about my personal experience on the blog, would help inspire so many young people to to see that you know when you're conscious it's not a, a matter of it's not even a matter of recognition but it's really a matter of doing what everyone else should do and not not that it's uh, it's noble and just to say that when you're doing activism it's difficult to work with um, leaders who still have the perception that young people need to listen and never to speak and that our our even our participation in rooms even in 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 in, in, play, in spaces where decisions are made and we are invited sometimes it's not to to really hear what you have to say or uh, listen to us but it is to tick the box that you know we had young people taking taking part in this discussion and now we're trying to say that, you know, we've been talking for far too long and we have policies, we have laws. So for me right now, it's a matter of pushing, pushing actors to act on what we have been saying, on what young people have been saying. And that bring, brings me to the Rome uh, Youth Call to Action, that, you know, the SDG 16 is there. We have the, the 2030 Agenda, and we have all the resolution to 250 and others. But then why is it that uh, young people still have to sing and shout at the top of their voices that, you know, this is what we want and this is what you should do. So the, the, the emphasis on institutions acting on what young people have said, enough recommendations have been made. And if we're being honest, there's nothing new that will be said right now by young people that has not been said. So right now we need to move the we need to move the discussion really to acting and and demanding accountability. Young people need to demand for accountability. If this if we are guaranteed our rights, it's in our constitutions, it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet young people have to are victims of state violence, of police violence, of gender-based violence. Why is it so? who is not doing their job and why are they still in those influential positions. And I think that the only way young people can demand for this accountability, one is if they're educated on their rights, uh, what they, I mean, what are the powers that they have and the best ways and the systems and the structures in which they can go about to demand for this accountability. Because what I see in the Maskan is, is that young people want to hold leaders accountable, but they don't know how to, or they don't know how to start. So maybe we can build the capacity of, of young people to understand what accountability looks like and then support them 
either through uh, technical resources, financial resources, support them in uh, demanding for accountability from uh, from the leaders. So I think from my experience, um, I would say that um, that's that's where we're moving in terms of the human rights uh, human rights work. But also just to mention that even when there is education, I think for Kenya and for different African countries, and I think other countries in the in the world, corruption is still a problem, and corruption is so discouraging that young people have resorted to just survive. They do not want to live anymore. That uh, the lack of accountability, the lack of transparency in governance, the lack of opportunities that young people can access because of corruption is really causing all these all, all these problems. And because of this, young people feel like they've been excluded. So the social exclusion uh, comes in uh, and young people feel like they're not part of the society. And what they do now is look for power and control elsewhere. And that's where their vulnerability comes in and they're able to, to fall uh, victims to extremist groups and, and violent groups. So the best way would be how can we um, how can we make everyone enjoy their rights, and while while doing that, ensure that we hold each other accountable as much as we hold the political um, leaders accountable. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Wevan. That was very useful and a great way to reflect on the initial presentations. I'd also mention, I believe Wevan is the colleague who coined the cool to be conscious phrase that Asako mentioned at the beginning, which I think we'll all be using moving ahead in our work. So thank you for that, Wevan, also. Um, we now have the time to have an interaction and we really hope to have some uh, sharing of experiences and questions. For the people online, there's two options for you to, to do so. Um, you have the option to speak for, for a short time, to share an experience or to ask a question. Um, and to do so, please just indicate that you want to have the floor in the comment box. Alternatively, if you just have a question you would like the speakers to answer, you can also just put your question specifically in the comment box and then we'll pick it up. So uh, those are the two options that you have. And then we also have colleagues here in New York. I think a couple of them want to share experiences. So I encourage you to indicate in the comment box if you want to take the floor just now or in the next 20 minutes or so to share your experience or if you have other questions. Uh, while we do so, I just uh, a couple of points that have jumped out so far just to get us just to get the ball rolling, I think. Um, is you know when we're talking about um, the human rights based approach to uh, youth engagement and youth empowerment, we're really looking at different elements of firstly um, looking at how to, how our work can help to improve progress towards human rights standards and can be aligned with human rights standards themselves as a really key component, making sure what we're doing is in line with human rights. And then the second aspect of it really is about the principles of human rights, which I think we've talked about such a lot this morning already with some great examples, which include the issue of accountability, as Wevan has spoken um, so eloquently about um, non-discrimination, um, as Daniel mentioned, uh, certainly in relation to his experience uh, experiences in Brazil, and then the issue of meaningful and inclusive participation, which I think from all of the speakers, they've spoken the, you know, they really address um, some of the uh, challenges, certainly, that young people have in participating, but I think overwhelmingly we've heard really positive stories about the different types of ways that young people are changing the narrative, are pushing the narrative, uh, the types of advocacy, the types of campaigns they can be involved with, that they're leading, um, and there's been some really fruitful examples of, of kind of movement making, if you like, on human rights and youth from a participation angle. Um, and I think that's linked up with a couple of sort of the big themes, um, which is the issue of um, having a culture of human rights and having education and awareness, which I think is linked to the standards. And then also um, looking at ensuring we have the space to, to um, ensure stakeholders have the engagement opportunities required to be able to push that narrative 
and the partnerships. So those are some of the initial themes from the speakers. I think we have one question, but there's potentially some more. Um, so let's just double check where we are with that. Um, nope. So the one question we have so far is on um, a, another really useful point in relation to the, the strategies for attracting young people to engage. Um, thinking about social media, thinking about innovation and storytelling, um, which I think some of the speakers have mentioned is, is really useful. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, any experiences they want to share, it would be great for you to ask for the floor or to put that in the comment box. Um, let's see if we get some more people speaking about that particular issue. And then perhaps here we'll go to one of our colleagues in the room who wanted to share um, for a moment some of the work she's doing in the UNDP office in Bangladesh. So maybe we can go to our colleague, um, Sharmila Rasul, for a moment to, for her to reflect on that. And we please do encourage you to engage in the comment box and uh, we have time to hear other experiences and we want to make use of that time. So our colleague, Sharmila, um, perhaps you might have to come closer to the okay, mic. Sharmila okay, is, is here in New York to, to, to speak about what resonates from your perspective. Thanks, Shamir. Yeah, just on, uh, to pick up from where you left, uh, Sarah, about how to, what are some important strategies to get youth to engage? I mean, uh, in Bangladesh, our experience has been that youth is not a homogeneous group, as we know. Um, and there are some groups that are much more empowered than others. And we found that particularly the youth from indigenous groups, indigenous communities, and also ethnic minorities, both ethnic and religious minorities, lack the space for engagement and is not really accepted or their voices are less heard, let me put it that way. So we've uh, found a way uh, to bring together some indigenous youth and ethnic minority youth uh, on a platform which is called Jubo Bangla, it means Young Bangla. We have 351 such members and they are all undergrads. So they are coming from a, a reasonably educated background, are able to articulate their issues. One of the strategies we used was using community radio. So these youth would be able to um, uh, present their views using their own language. So that has given them a sort of a comfortable platform to talk in their own language and also express themselves better. So that's one of the strategies I think worked well for Bangladesh, which I'm happy to share more if colleagues are interested and also can get in touch with me. Another important uh, lesson that I would like to also share is engaging youth in research work. So many of our policies, as you know, in UNDP and other agencies, I'm sure, we have uh, we do research to inform our policies. And during this research, we often don't involve youth because mostly the research are conducted by um, expert agencies and youth are not considered as an important stakeholder in research. So we have conducted five research uh, on different um, ethnic minority groups to look at what are some systemic human rights violations those, uh, those groups are facing involving the youth from those respective uh, communities. And this we did uh, not from a very legal perspective. We also uh, had an anthropological perspective to this research. And now the youth that were involved in the research really want to take it forward because they own it and it is in their community and it has, they tell us in their, I mean, in their view, they said that it has given them an opportunity to really understand their community better better that they didn't even know, that they didn't understand better in the beginning, but now after the research they want to engage more, they understand the community more, and are able to take those uh, findings of the research forward to advocate for better human rights. Last point is uh, engagement of youth with human rights, I, uh, human rights institutions, I think good idea, I heard that from also the Ukraine colleague. We are doing the same in Bangladesh, and we've succeeded um, uh, to an extent. Uh, I must say that uh, the chair herself in Bangladesh has written a song, <laughs> a very upbeat song, which is uh, now very quite becoming popular. It's about youth engagement uh, in human rights. So those are some of the examples and lessons from Bangladesh. Right, thanks. Thank you so much, Sharmila. I think, um, Again, you're highlighting the need to ensure that young people have a leadership role in the narratives on their own communities and their own context. 
um, and the importance of making sure that certainly from UNDP's side that's uh, front and centre in what we're doing. Um, so that's that's also a great example for us to reflect upon. Um, and Wevan is also contributing and giving us the link to the blog that she um, has. So um, I encourage colleagues to, to check out Behind the Lines and mentioning, of course, other means, social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, etc., etc. Um, obviously, communities in different contexts really use different instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that a very big dis di disparity in how people engage and, and young people, of course, are often at the forefront of technologies. Um, but there can be some great positivity um, to many of these instruments. And again, Wevin's content mentioning as well the um, amplifying effect that can have. And, and Neville is mentioning the, um, the opportunity that that has to feed into and to change the narratives. Um, we do have a, a, a question about the presentations and certainly we'll be sharing the presentations. So um, that's definitely the case. Um, any other questions that we... Um, yes, another comment in relation to uh, the different utilisation of different media platforms has been put, which I think is... Uh, very useful. You need to look at each national context. In some countries, some platforms are used very extensively, whereas in others, of course, they're not. Um, so that's also pointed out by Ole Olena. Thank you for um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, in terms of other points, do we have other speakers from the room who would like Esky. to make Esky. any points? Um, Esky, I... please. Yeah. Um, I have a thank you so much everyone for your valuable inputs and participations. I have a question in particular for Olena. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned the importance, significance of partnerships and finding the right actors on the ground. Um, I I wondered how you balanced uh, the risks and opportunities of partnering with governments on one hand and also supporting the youth when it comes to journalism and human rights. Um, because Ukraine is a close case to my heart. And um, I did work also with journalists previously. And in Ukraine, the risks for human rights advocates and journalists is kind of very dear in the Eastern Europe scale. But how, how did UNDP navigate around those relationships to ensure in one hand you have the buy-in of the government in your work with Ministry of Culture to replicate these education platforms, but at the same time um, visibly and proudly supporting the journalists on the ground? Has there been any um, lessons that you've learned from that process that you could share with us? Great. Elena, can you respond to that just now? If you if you can unmute, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the question. It's a really good one. And uh, I could just say that it's important to understand the objectives of our potential partners and be able to provide the best response to meet their objectives. So, for example, um, uh, when we wanted to work with journalists, we focused on... Uh, uh, working with journalism education in principle. So for that, we needed to work with the universities and different uh, civil society unions like the Union of uh, uh, Journalists. So uh, with them, we uh, promote tolerance, we promote human rights values, we try to make sure that young people understand the uh, challenges and the difficulties that people uh, of different groups face in their daily life so that they come prepared when they enter the professional, so to say, uh, circles, when they graduate from the universities and start applying these uh, uh, no the knowledges and skills that they've received through this uh, journalism education work. Whereas when we work with the Ministry of Culture and Youth and Sports, it's also a very um, important issue for them because one part of their mandate is to make sure that they increase youth participation. So they do work a lot to contribute to youth participation at the country level. Uh, for them, whatever we are proposing as the program of youth workers, for example, or any other, uh, is something that helps them to achieve their goals. But at the same time, even within this ministry, 
there is some internal resistance. For example, they have the department, which is the so-called Department of National and Patriotic Education. And this department is traditionally against human rights agenda in principle because they promote the so-called traditional family values. And in Ukraine, this traditional family values is perceived as something against uh, gender, against the rights of, for example, LGBTQ community. And uh, it's extremely difficult to navigate even within the ministry. So we try to organize the participatory discussion, like the inclusive process, to make sure that uh, all the departments having different views and different ideas of what youth participation is come together and try to come to terms what civic education means for the country. And uh, we've done that through the work to develop the national concept of civic education. So we organized the a uh, working group consisting of the representatives of the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Education, human rights defenders, the experts on youth and on human rights, and we ask them to express their opinions, what civic education means, and how Ukraine should develop the civic education. It was a long and painful process because uh, there were a lot of misunderstandings within this group, but after a year and a half, I think, uh, it finally resulted in uh, the concept that everybody was happy with and everybody decided that they, are, uh, that they see their objectives and their goals in this version of the concept. And this document has been adopted as the national policy. So to be able to navigate between different you know, interests and opinions, uh, I, we believe the best uh, option is to create the platform for dialogue and provide an opportunity for everybody to uh, contribute to voice their concerns and finally agree with everybody else. Thank you so much, Elena. That's really useful. Um, we're interested to hear some other experiences. One other dimension I wanted to mention in relation to um, the human rights side is in relation to the human rights mechanisms. Um, to what extent are young people engaging with the mechanisms? Do they see that that is an opportunity to strengthen accountability? Um, going back to that issue, um, I'd, I'd mentioned that you know we're in the third cycle of the universal periodic review process right now, which is the Human Rights Council review mm -hmm. of all member states and their human rights obligations. Um, so unlike um, treaties where states have to, um, states voluntarily agree to be bound, all member states participate in the review of their human rights record in the UPR. Um, and it's a really innovative process because it involves a lot of peer engagement and member states receive recommendations from other countries as to how they can support human rights more effectively. Um, in the first cycle of the UPR, which started uh, over 10 years ago, ago now, only 26 recommendations were made to all countries that participated that talked about youth. Um, but in the second cycle, um, there was over 120. Uh, so we saw a really big increase uh, by, by a factor of four in the second cycle to discussions on youth at the UPR process. Um, and now we're in the middle of the third phase. Um, well, it's actually just started. We're at the end of the first year of the first phase of the third cycle. That's a long, confusing sentence. But, uh, and already we've had somewhere around 30 or so recommendations to those first states in the first year. So mm -hmm. if things escalate, we, we would hope to certainly see at least the same level of discussion on youth issues at the UPR in the third cycle as we did in the second, and perhaps even more. So a question to any of the participants is when through your work with young people, to what extent is their engagement with uh, the UPR process specifically, but any other international or, or national mechanisms of accountability? I think Olenu spoke about the work that UNDP is Ukraine is doing with the National Human Rights Institution, and these bodies can be very critical to highlight um, inequalities to. Uh, support human rights education and promotional um, work on human rights at country level and I think there are some of the partners in the Bangladesh case mm -hmm. also. Um, so any reflections um, on 
work in relation to these these institutions that are empowered to support a, a strong narrative of human rights at country level would be useful to hear. And also we encourage you again to, to, to recommend ways that we can look to new areas of engagement, new, uh, new areas where we can be improving our work and we can be thinking about um, looking ahead to different uh, frontiers in this issue. So we invite any other participants from the online um, community who are with us to share any of their experiences um, or questions. We'll, we'll happily hand the mic over to you. Um, but also, if you just have a question you'd like addressed, um, you could also put that in the comment box. Um, and following that, we'll go back to the speakers for any last reflections that they would have before we close. But um, if anybody has any more uh, comments or, or points from the from the online participants, now would be the moment to highlight you would like the floor. Okay, maybe just uh, to follow up on uh, your question and comment, Sarah, this is Maria, part of the youth and governance team here with UNDP in New York. And I think what we have both heard in the presentations and comments today is really also talking about the equality in partnerships with young people to promote human rights, but also how to co-create, whether it is research or program designs, as well as the accessibility, if it's in the own language and so forth. And often in the conversations we have with young people and youth constituencies, these are also some of the challenges and barriers that comes up when they engage with the institutions because we need so much time and also we need to open up. So I think it, just to underline the importance that we have to have these conversations, especially when we are uh, partnering with the national human rights institutions, with the governments and with young people as it is partnerships where we will have to consider how we are engaging and uh, bringing in young people in a partnership role, in a leadership role from the very beginning. Yeah, thank you, Maria. And I think the point that um, Wevin made, but I think was also very much implied in the other speakers, is the uneven power dynamics in these Absolutely. relationships, <laughs> which is a very critical aspect to take into account when you're utilising the human rights-based approach, which really looks at the sort of elite capture of certain mm -hmm. processes that can work to the exclusion either explicitly or implicitly of affected populations and how that specifically may be a barrier for young people and this I think is linked to the point on the narrative formulation in this campaigning and again the the issue of leadership which um, has come up so prominently the courageous leadership of many young human rights defenders um, we have a response from Elenu on the National Human Rights Institution aspect um, emphasizing that they do play a regular role meeting with young people and, and ensuring that there's a strong coordination and, and cooperation and of course I think when we think about UNDP I mean the majority of the populations in our program countries are young people yeah. um, so it is the majority of our one of, one of certainly the large majorities of our target po populations, if you like. So how can we as UNDP also be learning to improve our approaches to ensure the centrality of young people in our development uh, programming and in our development initiatives? Um, specifically, um, when we listen to so many of the positive experiences of young people being central to uh, social cohesion and many other aspects which are so critical to our work. So I think that we can take away a lot of those lessons. Um, I'd like to go back to the panelists if they have one or two moments. Actually, we only really have one moment because we will finish at 10.30. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to give the floor back to the panelists again with our thanks to you. Um, if you have uh, any, any last minute thoughts or reflections based on how the conversation has went, we'd be really grateful to, to hear your final, uh, final perspectives. So we'll head over to uh, the first speaker, um, Neville. Yeah. If you are there, Neville, still, if we still have you. Because I don't see him. 
Um, I think he had some connectivity issues, so perhaps. No, he's still, here. No, he's still no. there. Muted. Uh, but um, <clears throat> well, perhaps we could go. We'll come back to Neville. If Olena, are you there? Could you? Do you have any other points you wanted to make for a moment? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks a lot for this uh, very rich and insightful discussion. And I want to uh, um, commit that uh, if any of our experiences is, in is of interest to any of the participants, we are ready to share, to send you all the materials that I was talking about and to explain more in details uh, how we went about any of the activities. Uh, but what I was also uh, having in mind that uh, when I was talking about our current challenge to design the nationwide uh, social cohesion and national unity program, which will be largely about tolerance, human rights, non-discrimination and all those issues, uh, uh, we would uh, uh, also be very much interested to hear from you if anyone thinks that uh, you have relevant experiences or relevant uh, examples to share with us, which would be helpful to us uh, at this stage to uh, help the government design this program. We will be very helpful. We will be very, very happy to look into that. I know that uh, Susanna is also online with us uh, from the Istanbul Regional Hub, and I would like to acknowledge that we've received a lot of advice from her um, from the experiences of the countries of our region, but we, we are also open to learn from any other successful practices and cases elsewhere. Thank you very much in advance for your support. Um, and the next, uh, Danielle, I'm not sure if you, if you have anything you would like to um, add for a moment before we close. Oh, no, thank you for, first of all, thank you so much for all your um, sharings because it's very, I think it's very important and helpful for me here in Brazil because we have a lot of similarities in the work that we are doing. And I think just for this closing remarks, I think that's going to be quite important from now on, we from the civil society organizations and also United Nations to be getting closer and closer and getting more consent about the narrative, the narrative we are going to create about to play the role of youth in security. Uh, for example, we had a discussion about medias, but from my perspective in Brazil, for example, young people do have access to internet, but the way they use it is non-political. So they usually do not engage in groups or kind of web pages that are political. We did a, we led a research here in Brazil for the own internet use with UNICEF. And that, that was a result that people are online do, just through social media, young people. So this kind of creating and supporting young people to be more involved on this agenda. So just to make it clear, we have to have a clear narrative about the role of young people and to spread the message. Even in Portuguese, that is not an official language, so we must cooperate with civil society organizations to spread the message on the ways the young people are using. And maybe here in Brazil, for example, in a lot of Latin American countries, it, it has to be peer by peer, like going to schools, going to places and doing a campaign that's going to be grassroots, not rely only on social medias. And that's a, it's a joint effort. And another thing, thing that we always have to keep in mind is that because young people are very vulnerable, they have a real high cost of participation. So if we have to put, keep in mind that we, when we do programs, it's important to think about if we have stipends available for young people to join courses, to join workshops, if we can provide, for example, food for people that are coming from marginal communities, or transportation, and any kind of support that can lower down the participation cost of young people who are really in a vulnerable situation. Because one of the concerns we have is that in, very, in several spaces of decision, only the young people who already has a leadership status and support for foundations or NGOs are the ones that who can truly join the discussions and becomes really limited for young, young, young people with leadership status, like with international background and stuff. So we have to lower the standards sometimes and also provide support for people really in the forefront of the human rights violations and peace and security to join the discussion. 
Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, Neville, um, I think, had some connectivity issues, but he's, he's sent through just a, a, an important message on the importance of active participation, empowerment in relation to the vital role young people play in their communities. And um, again, going back on the issue of developing knowledge on human rights, I think that's a consistent theme um, that we've heard, linked both to the education issue in terms of knowing the human rights standards, and but then also this very important point that's been made about the narrative around young people and rights and this positive change and positive impact that young people bring leading in this space and, and then the civic action. And you've ended with a very, um, very apt apt quote, youth are not youth, youth less, but used less. So thank you for that. Um, so we are, um, we are, and then one last comment in relation to, again, civic participation from Sarah Oliver from URI. Thank you, Sarah. So we're closing up now. Um, I'll just hand the floor over to Noella to make a last moment. I think I've reflected on the trends um, throughout the moderated discussion, so I don't want to repeat them now. But to say that we will uh, share the webinar and the link to the webinar through the COP and I think also uh, a write-up of some of the key uh, conclusions and the way forward. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the presentations and we will share them and also the, those colleagues who have offered to uh, share their experiences. Olano from the country office will certainly include some contact information so that colleagues are in a position to be in touch and we can promote this real peer-to-peer uh, knowledge exchange um, and experience exchange that we're aiming to today. So uh, once again, from my side, thank you so much. It's been a really inspiring discussion, particularly to the colleagues who are outside of UNDP for sharing our time, but also, of course, to, to all of the colleagues inside of UNDP. And I'll just pass to Noella. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you, Sarah, really for a wonderful uh, a summary of the of the discussions. Uh, we often say that this is just the beginning of a conversation, not the beginning of a conversation, you know. But uh, but but we 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 really want to have a series of webinars uh, on thematic issues related to uh, related to youth. I have to say, I mean, from from the youth team's perspective, it's really. Uh, quite amazing to see how colleagues also within UNDP have been embracing uh, this agenda and uh, really, really going deeper into their own thematic area from a youth perspective. And 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 that that really, um, yeah, I think that that's quite something that we should be collectively also happy about. There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, we still need to open up our own channels. We still need to think about our own uh, modalities of operations as well. Uh, a lot of our work is not necessarily funding directly youth organizations, for instance, that are leading great work. We need to think about, about these aspects as well as we build up uh, our programs. Um, I just want to really, really thank everyone who participated, in particular our speakers, our team here uh, who's, who supported the development of this, of this webinar. Um, we spoke briefly about frontier issues. One of them is how we support the role of young environmental uh, rights, also defenders. And uh, we, we will have soon another webinar on youth and climate action. Uh, we want to see, I mean, this, uh, this conversation in 2020 in particular, the super year for nature, happen in a, in a different way and we'll try in UNDP to, uh, to, to lift a lot of these good practices as well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this uh, webinar will also be available for external participants on our YouTube channel, the UNDP team, um, youth team, uh, YouTube channel, and also youth for peace. Uh, dot info. So, uh, voila. I think that that, uh, that concludes our webinar and uh, we thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.